So I'm here at the ferry port. I'm a bit early and it's raining. And I thought I'd just share a few of my thoughts with you. A kind of efficient use of my time. In general, then we are in awe of nature. And we're very willing to tolerate it for a weekend, camping, scuba diving, that sort of thing. But normally then, we really look forward to going back to our home. Where we have all our stuff, everything we're familiar with and that we need to be comfortable. But this is a sign that we're not really spiritual practitioners. The term in the Tibetan language is one who has gone from the home into homelessness. And the word for a mendicant, rapjung, means someone who has gone forth. That means they've gone forth from the worldly life. And in the time of the Buddha, then literally they left their family home and went to either join a spiritual community, living in the forest or in the mountains, or they went off on their own to live solitary in a cave like Milarepa. But because of our culture, the way we live, then we misidentify what a spiritual practitioner is. Especially in the Tibetan tradition then, we tend to see a Lama who's got a big name and lots of followers, somebody famous, a Tulku, as being an authentic spiritual practitioner. They tend to travel everywhere in big cars with a huge entourage and fly from one place to another. And in the Western context, then these spiritual teachers, well, they fly around, they go to various kind of uh, spiritual hotels, I suppose, the kind of places where they have conventions and people talk about meditation and yoga and that sort of thing. These places hold maybe up to 500 people and you uh, pay three or four thousand dollars a week to receive daily instructions and have guided meditations, eat nice organic vegetarian and vegan food, and socialize with the spiritual community. They're mostly like-minded, educated professionals with liberal politics, teachers, doctors, lawyers, that sort of thing. And their spiritual teachers are pretty much the same. They're usually eloquent, educated, and they have an upper middle class upbringing, just like their students. Mostly what they teach is about the world, is about how to be happy and healthy in the world. Many of these teachers are really nice. They're well motivated. Like I said, they're really eloquent, often well read. And they appeal to their students because they're like minded. But as I said, we don't really know how to identify a spiritual practitioner. For example, if we see somebody sleeping rough, and pushing a shopping trolley around town, then the first thought that comes to our mind, usually, is that they're somebody who's down on their luck or a drug addict. We either treat them with derision or we feel sorry for them. 
But somebody who understands this path will wonder. They'll think to themselves, could this be a yogi? A spiritual practitioner? But for us, we can't see that. Like I said, we either look down on them or we feel sorry for them. But we don't think that they're some kind of Dharma practitioner. But if you look at the life stories of the masters of the past, this is exactly how they lived. When Naropa went seeking Tilopa, his teacher of many lifetimes, and he asked, does anybody know in these parts of a yogi called Tilopa? And they all said, well, I've never heard of a yogi or a spiritual practitioner called Tilopa, but there's a beggar there sitting on the beach. His name's Tilopa. Tilopa was sitting on the beach and he had a little fire going and a frying pan. And he was taking live fish out of a bucket and frying them in the pan alive. And every time he killed one of these fish, he would snap his fingers. He looked a sight. He looked like a beggar or a madman. Now, Naropa was not only educated, learned in the Dharma, he was somebody with a position and status, but also he had a royal heritage. He was an upper-class individual. Like I say, he was really learned. He was one of the gatekeepers of a Buddhist university. And that's no mean feat. That's really difficult. In order to be a gatekeeper, you have to be extremely knowledgeable. Because your job is, anybody who comes to the gate of the university has to debate with you if they want to get in. And they've got to beat you. And often, then, uh, Turtikas, uh, Panditas from other religions, would come to the university and try to gain entrance. And so you had to be pretty sharp to be a gatekeeper. And Naropa was extremely learned. He was learned in all of the sutras, but also in the tantras. The problem is, Naropa hadn't realized the inner meaning of practice. He only knew the words. So he knew he had to go look for his teacher. And when he saw the beggar Tilopa, who acted like a madman, he didn't think, well, that can't be him. He thought this must be him. So you see, he knew something about the Dharma. And we don't. So recently, then we met a new friend on the channel. I think his name is Azmiel. Sorry if I haven't pronounced that right. I think he was a software programmer or something in California. Anyway, he gave everything up. And now he sleeps rough outside in parks and gardens. Shopping center parking lots, I guess. With his two bodhisattva pooches. He has simplified his life and removed himself from all the trappings of mundane existence. And so he's got lots of time. He's got time to practice and meditate. But again, like I say, when we meet somebody like that, we either feel sorry for them or we're wary of them. We think they're a bit crazy. But if you listen to what he has to say on his uh, 
Dharma Bum Production YouTube channel, then I can't find any fault in it. I mean, he said, if you see the faults of a mistaken Vajrayana practice arising for you, then just set it aside and return to your core practice of sitting and studying the scriptures. Uh, that is so true. In fact, everything he says is correct. I mean, I've spent a lot of time in retreat, right? With loads of different practitioners. And some of them are relatively learned. Uh, for Westerners, anyway. Not when it comes to um, Tibetans. But they're quite learned in the words. And they've been in retreat, some of them, for more than 12 years. But if I'm being honest... Then our friend on Dharma Bomb Productions, as far as I can see anyway, understands the path better than they do. That's because he's putting it into practice. But he did say, quite frankly, to all of you, well, you're better to stay at home. This isn't for everyone. It isn't easy. But for him, it brings great joy. And that's another sign that he knows what he's talking about. Because all the trappings of worldly life themselves are nothing but suffering. They're just a big headache. The question is, how come we can't let go of it like he can? I agree with him. Stay put. Don't run off to the mountain cave. Loads of Westerners make this mistake. They want to emulate the yogis of the past. They want to be like Asmiel. But the fact is, they're not able to do it. And if you give everything up and you run off to the mountain and after a few months you get fed up and you can't cope anymore, then what are you going to do? We've just got to practice the best we can to our ability and in harmony with our natural disposition. Well, anyway. That's about all I wanted to say. I better get back to the car. I've promised one of my friends online a conversation. Um, so I better do that. But you should know that the reason why I go through all this trouble and hardship, and it is some amount of hardship, it's not easy. It's because it's my sincere wish that I may be able to benefit you in some way so that you may achieve happiness and well-being and progress swiftly on this most sublime spiritual journey to final awakening and freedom from suffering and the six realms of samsara. And because of that, then I'm willing to put the effort in. And also, it brings me great happiness to see you change or transform your minds. And people are doing that. At first I thought it was almost impossible. What do I mean by that? Well, some people gave up on meditation. 
and now they've renewed their interest and enthusiasm for practice. Some people had very fixed and certain ideas about reality that they've now seen to be mistaken. And this has encouraged them to have another look and once again apply themselves. And so that makes me happy because I know I'm not wasting my life. As I said before, it's difficult to bring actual benefit, right? We tend to think that if we want to benefit others, then we should give them food and money and that sort of thing. That's not what the Buddha did. The Buddha taught the Dharma. And that's because it is by the individual contemplating the meaning of the Dharma, then they come to change their minds. In general, there's four types of generosity as taught in the Buddha Dharma. There's the generosity of giving kind of small things or insignificant things like bits of food or a little money. There's the generosity of giving vast stores of wealth and resources. There's the generosity of giving protection from fear. But the most important form of generosity is the generosity of giving the Dharma. And to be honest, it's difficult uh, to give the Dharma in an authentic way. And it's difficult to benefit others and not to bring them harm. So anyway, I think I've said a bit too much. Uh, until next time. And see you later.